thanks rakhi and thanks dr ranjit singh uh, for giving me the opportunity so friends uh, the question arises at the outset why i chose this topic which is related to the proficiency and competency of forensic document examiners so there is also a history behind it uh, what i found from my experience of uh, over 44 years going to the various courts of law also and tendering evidences forensic document examination is perhaps the only field of forensic science which has attracted too many lay persons into the profession even section 45 of indian evidence act does not lay down strict criteria or guidelines in this regard Uh, though i am not uh, right uh, against the right to education of individuals and as such every individual has a uh, fundamental right of acquiring knowledge of any discipline or field of study but the hard fact remains that one can only become uh, a jack of all trades and interestingly uh, uh, master of only one or none at all uh, friends uh, in my opinion lay persons who are having little knowledge or just half baked knowledge of any subject are not suitable for doing practice in forensic document examination as examination of documents is undoubtedly a serious business because it has far and wide implications that may affect the life liberty or property of any individual hence uh, the job of forensic document examiner must be assigned to a well qualified trained and experienced document examiner and certainly not to a lay person or a half baked expert as he is called sometimes uh, today's presentation covers several aspects related to the requirements of the knowledge experience proficiency and testing uh, proficiency and competency of a forensic document examiner which is a long run process uh, development and refinement of skill of such professionals not only document professionals but there are other professionals as well of this type who need apprenticeship training for example lawyers and uh, you see uh, other uh, training uh, professionals also so they definitely need uh, protracted training over a period of time it consumes a considerable period of one's lifetime before he attains the level of one's maturity uh, for practice so this being so uh, the need for training knowledge and experience Spe rather specialized knowledge and experience in the field of document examination cannot be over emphasized and hence there is a value of hands on experience uh, while grooming and grounding of a professional document examiner into the uh, this uh, profession of utility which is more than 500 years old profession but still so many people think that they can become the experts or rather they are already the expert part experts in the field and they can uh, practice also and some of the people are also appearing in the courts of law uh, under the garb of the section 45 of indian evidence act so now i come to the uh, main part you see uh, next slide you see uh, uh, Mosin Kam conducted uh, empirical studies uh, where he concluded that lay persons were six times more likely uh, to incorrectly identify question writing compared with the forensic document examiners. Uh, so this is also an important observation uh, between when we compare the lay persons with the forensic document examiners. Further. Uh, Paul Kirk, who is an authority in uh, criminal investigation, made this remark in his book in 1966. Perhaps in no field of physical evidence examination do 
so many people consider themselves competent to decide identities for the simple reason that they have been doing exactly that to some extent during much of their lives. Yet, handwriting examination is a highly technical matter calling for as much or more experience and knowledge than does any other field of physical evidence examination. So uh, this is the, this underlines the requirement of specialized training for the forensic document examination. Uh, then uh, coming to the introductory part, you see there is a Belgium proverb that experience is the comb that nature gives us after we become bald. And uh, in this short span of life, we should not only learn from our own experience, but should also benefit from the experience of others. This can save us from many traps and the uh, resultant issues associated with it, which is similar to reinventing the wheel. So now I, now I come to the overview of knowledge and experience. Uh, though it is a wide field, wide field, so I will restrict my observations to the authorities in document examination like Osborne, uh, you see uh, Huber and Hedrick, Paul Kirk, etc. So is there any difference between knowledge and experience? Maybe there is some, but still knowledge and experience are intertwined. They are in fact complementary. Uh, Osborne has stated in his book, there are two kinds of knowledge, actual knowledge and potential knowledge. Actual knowledge is the knowing of a thing, whereas potential knowledge is knowing where you can find out about it. This is a very important part. This is a statement from Osborne's problem of proof. Then there is yet another form of knowledge that is called intuition. It is the ability to acquire knowledge without recourse to conscious reasoning. It may or may not be scientific, but still it has some value, at least in preliminary phases of investigation or preliminary phases of document examination. So as, uh, as far as this uh, intuition is concerned, Osborne has made an important observation in problem of proof. Uh, giving the example, it is by a sort of intuition that one suspects the truth of a tale too highly embellished. Without analysis of any kind, we sometimes say that a story of this kind does not sound right. In a recent opinion of a high court, this statement is made, this testimony bears the unmistakable stamp of truth. Pardon, unmistakable stamp of truth. There is no business of the trial attorney more important than learning just what this stamp consists of you will be surprised to know that no science or no human knowledge can be uh, a gospel truth or absolutely perfect. So Osborne has made yet another statement that uh, giving the benefit of, you see, trained intuition. There is a simple intuition and that is there is a trained intuition. By study, experience and a trained intuition, the lawyer will also have acquired an instant appreciation of the significance and force of evidence and will have learned its correct order of presentation. Lawyer also, profession of lawyer also is a um, similar, is a profession which is similar to the document examination. Hanging a degree just in the office uh, is no good. Actual work that is done in the field after uh, the attaining the degree of qualification under the guidance of some uh, senior uh, lawyers or senior advocates for a considerable length of time, that makes one a good, exam, uh, good lawyer or a good examiner, good professional rather. Then Paul Kirk has made another uh, important observation regarding intuitive approach. And almost intuitive approach is utilized by bank clerks and businessmen in identifying signatures. You see, bank clerks also routinely identify so many signatures on checks. So, and it is the failure of such individuals to understand the interpretation of the pattern in terms of its details that prevents them from being the actual experts. Uh, 
uh, that many at times assume themselves to be. To establish fully the analysis of an individual reflex pattern requires in practice a careful study of each and every factor of the writing, which is its expression and a virtual statistical analysis of these detailed factors. It is in the later requirement, particularly that most authorities in this field have been found to be deficient. So this is very important part. You see in critical analysis of the documents or intricate study of the documents, uh, it is this thing in which the layman will found, be found, uh, you see, deficient because they do not have uh, an in-depth knowledge of the subject. They just have a superficial knowledge of the suspect by virtue of their uh, Google search, simple Google search or uh, hearsay uh, learning. Then Osborne has made yet another statement. The instant recognition of a writing by intuition, the experienced examiner not only does not attempt, but studiously avoids. He reserves judgment until all the qualities of writing have been observed and compared. This is imperative for a document examiner that he must reserve his judgment and should not base his final judgment simply on intuition and look for other scientific evidence to base his opinion. Oh, and uh, another important observation, but a long uh, quotation from Osborne reads, the technical enthusiast misled by unscientific praise often flatters himself that he has acquired a kind of occult power above reason. A writer on the so-called science of graphology, for example, says, is it not possible that some of these fine and acute touches may have been arrived at through some subtle transference of ideas beyond the concept of the senses? This insight, this seer faculty is not so rare as might be supposed and under proper and controlling restrictions is, I am confident, one of the highest qualities of which the soul is capable of. These words exactly describe the mental condition of certain enthusiastic specialists whose ideas come from beyond the concept of the senses. They often apparently are deficient in ordinary common sense and are unable to appreciate how ridiculous their metaphysical claims are to those who are still under the control of reason. This so-called occult intuition is many times accompanied by untrained reason, even if not mixed with pretension, stupidity, and fraud. As already suggested, the careful lawyer does not wait till he gets into the court to find that his witness cannot show to others what he himself claims to know and to see. You see, uh, demonstration of uh, knowledge and experience, demonstration of findings is another important aspect of forensic science. Uh, what cannot be demonstrated is no evidence at all. Then uh, in a special testimony by an informed and experienced observer in which facts and circumstances are interpreted, what may appear to be almost an offhand opinion necessarily is the result of a definite course of reasoning. Uh, if the reasoning is not outlined and explained in any way, the conclusion may seem to be merely an intuitive opinion. But this is not the fact in some cases in which expert has given the opinion because uh, the reasons may not have been enclosed along with the opinion, but they may have been given separately at the time of evidence, as was the practice in older times. So Osborne has also stated very important uh, thing that as a rule, success in these various quests is more the result of industry uh, rather than of intuition or of genius. Although there are practitioners who seem to have developed a kind of second sight that enables them to find the facts and the law that are necessary to success. And Osborne has cautioned the uh, serious experts, the bare intuition, although sometimes helpful and occasionally pointing the true way, is an unsafe guide. And at the outset should al always be subordinated. Subordinated means to other type of evidence which can be proved in the court of law. 
then uh, i come to the tragedy of knowledge and experience the unfortunate part you see most of the people think they have knowledge but in fact they do not have knowledge unless they know the, their limitation unless no they know what they do not know they are ignorant so uh, as regard the tragedy of knowledge and experience osborn has uh, stated there is sometimes greater danger from half knowledge a little learning than from complete ignorance if a smattering of knowledge from limited experience or superficial reading or information is accompanied by presumption as is often the case the truth and justice are in peril when one thus prepared testifies in court regarding grave and important issues and the real proof of the truth of a principle is not the finding of it in a book even in this book as stated by osborn but in the conditions facts and essence of things as interpreted and demonstrated by research actual experimentation and correct reasoning lack of reasoning power which is the child of ignorance is the main hindrance and bar to progress ignorance or inexperience may lead to wrong reasoning on any of these general or individual qualities or may omit reasoning friends these observations are osborn are far away from the understanding of the lay people even uh, some of the experts who have not gone through osborn may not be fully aware of them unless they try to read osborn and refresh osborn so then uh, the honest but incompetent witness who thought perhaps that he could tell the approximate age of an ink well when properly tested promptly admit his inability to do what he thought he could do those who expose their undeveloped natures would of course not do it if they knew they were doing it the tragedy of ignorance is the ignorance of it this is very important part the tragedy of ignorance is the ignorance of it and according to a famous quote even the best natured people if they are uninstructed and unbridled are always blind and uncertain we must take pains so that ignorance makes us neither too blind nor too bold this is very important we have to follow a balanced approach another sensible caution by george bernard shaw reads beware of false knowledge it's more dangerous than ignorance and white headed mays yet imp- very important remark not ignorance but ignorance of ignorance is the death of knowledge see the beauty of the language ignorance of ignorance is the death of knowledge it is not sheer ignorance then i come to the diversity of experience and role of experience that is played uh, especially in forensic document examination friends experience uh, as stated by james baldwin it is a private very largely a speechless affair and uh, osborn has uh, given the value of experience the value of experience in some professions at least does not depend so much on the fact that it supplies added technical knowledge as that it furnishes opportunities for a testing of knowledge and a study of the humanities so called that develops a philosophy of life and this necessary knowledge of human nature already referred to that gives balance sanity and wisdom its value therefore depends not so much on increase in knowledge as on the weighing and appraisal of the knowledge already obtained and its application to humanity and to affairs the highest act of wisdom is determining what is important and what is unimportant see the beauty of the language the advice given by osborn the highest act of wisdom is determining what is important and what is unimportant the recent graduate would perhaps be better qualified for a technical examination on some phases of his profession than the experienced practitioner and seasoned veteran but he lacks that testing and measuring of knowledge as applied to human affairs that only experience supplies knowledge of these facts regarding experience develops in the beginner that caution and appreciation of advice that tends towards avoidance of errors that may lead to humiliation and defeat 
Now, uh, Oswam has stated very important thing here. In many instances, the training that comes to the professional man is the most important part of his education. Certain important phases of education actually begin after formal education has ended. Although this formal education should have laid the firm foundation upon which the after development is based. Biography and observation, however, teach that a certainty, a thoroughness and a self-reliance in many instances have grown out of the sustained drudgery of what has been almost exclusive self-teaching that has developed strong qualities which almost command success. The thorough college of hard knocks, see the language, beauty of the language, the thorough college of hard knocks has been a reality in thousands of instances. You see the real experience is gathered by burning one's, by burning one's own fingers. And uh, coming to the value of experience in forensic document examination, uh, there are these two kinds of knowledge and there are two kinds of technical books written, Osborne has stated, uh, those that grow out of life and experience and those that grow out of a library. The man who has navigated a ship or plowed a field or pursued a hare writes of the performance in a different way than the mere doctrinaire. You see, you have, he has, Osborne has described the qualities of an expert. The qualified and experienced examiner of disputed writing who has examined hundreds of forgeries of all kinds and classes brings to such an examination an experience and memory of common qualities and frequently occurring characteristics of actual forgery that illuminate a new inquiry. But even this examiner sometimes must give a qualified opinion regarding a disputed signature. If this is true of the qualified and experienced examiner, it is easy to understand how utterly incapable in many instances the ordinary observer is to determine whether or not a disputed signature is genuine. There are here and there judges who like certain bankers seem inclined to think any signature is genuine if they can read it. Then uh, you see the development of all professional men like lawyer, engineer, question document examiner or doctor or numerous others is along similar lines, but not just the same. After formal education ends, progress depends on what is learned in this new school of experience in which there are few teachers and few textbooks. Unlike theoretical education, this hard school of experience tests methods and theories by practical facts and concrete results. This iron rule is in force in all fields of human endeavor. And certain kinds of skill cannot be learned from books nor from teachers but must be learned by conduct with the realities. This phase of preparation should be considered as part of the preparatory course of study and should be utilized to the fullest possible extent by reviewing, criticizing and recording so that every new experience is a new lesson. Then uh, real-time experience is an essential component of training. Real-time experience, on-the-job experience. The qualified and experienced question document examiner will have before him when he testifies the document and the writings described in the case as standards, but he has much more in his mind than this. He has his knowledge of all the various systems of writing used and taught in his community and the sprinkling of foreign and fantastic styles. He has in mind the great number of natural and common variations that the human hand and mind develops and still more important. He has a memory of the scores of forgeries of high and low degree that have come before him and he and the excuses, explanations and attempted justification of damaging divergences in bad writing. And finally, he has knowledge of the incentives, motives and conditions out of which many of these suspected writings arise. There is nothing that can take the place of this actual experience, although it must be based upon study and experimentation that in large measure is similar to parts of a regular college course of study. Such things, such traits cannot be learned by a layman. And 
commenting on the uh, value of experience, Osborne has say, said, it is said indeed that experience cannot be inherited. But each new candidate must in some measure burn his own fingers and take his own beatings. But if he will, he can learn something from those who have already gone over the road. With all the advice and warnings and books, he cannot quite stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before. But he can avoid some of the muck and mire that otherwise he must wade through. He will inevitably meet defeat now and then. And if he is wise, he will learn its hard but valuable lessons. You see the description Osborne has given. These are the requirements of a forensic document examiner, which are necessary for his grounding and grooming. And Conway has stated, only through extensive experience in evaluating thousands of writings of all classes can one estimate accurately the relative singularity, the relative individuality of a point of similarity or a difference. See uh, the requirement of the expert what the expert knows from his experience or from his study, what the layman cannot know. And then uh, quality of experience is far more important than quantity. It is not the hours you put in your work that counts. It is the work you put in those hours that is important. And Paul Kirk has made interesting uh, observation. The question of what constitutes adequate experience for the expert witness is one which is critical in court procedures and which appears to be poorly understood in many quarters. It is quite common for the witness to be interrogated as to the number of years during which he has worked in a field, the number of places of evidence he has examined, and similar quantitative questions. It must be apparent that the amount of his experience is not important beside the question of what he has learned from it. A commuter might well ride the same bus line for years without noting the streets traversed by the bus. The bank clerk may certainly examine signatures by the tens or hundreds of thousands, yet not make himself an expert in handwriting by virtue of his long experience. Qualitative experience, on the other hand, may be very limited and still be entirely sufficient for the matter at hand. The trained and skillful investigator may, in the course of one or a few hours, master a knowledge of the features which are necessary to establish an identity with a particular type of evidence. That short but carefully directed experience combined with a sound background knowledge of identification work in general way may be more than sufficient to qualify the investigator as an expert in so far as the particular point of the investigation is concerned. So Huber and Hedrick has pointed out, it is reassuring that in recent years, some courts have adopted a more critical attitude towards the admissibility of expert testimony. They have held that such witnesses are unqualified when they have minimal practical experience, when they have gained their knowledge merely from self-study and or from a correspondence course, and when they use their expertise as a hobby and not as a profession. One court has held that training as a graphologist or a graphoanalyst is irrelevant for testimony as a document examiner. Uh, and again, uh, highlighting the need of uh, training and experience in uh, forensic document examination, Kirk has stated, in no field of physical evidence examination do so many people consider themselves competent to decide identities for the simple reason that they have been doing exactly that to some extent during much of their lives. Yet, handwriting examination is a highly technical matter calling for as much or more experience and knowledge than does any other field of physical evidence examination required. And coming to the proficiency and competency of forensic document examiners, uh, it may be useful to consider all those who attempt the individualization of evidence in their day-to-day -day work as forensic scientists, whatever basic sciences they use to do this. Proficiency testing has been extensively used to measure the performance of forensic scientists. However, this is not true workplace performance. That is to say, performance on live casework in typical casework situations. As such, far too much can be read into the apparent assurance such scheme provides. It does have its uses, however, for example, benchmarking performance against other people or organization doing the same thing. Even you see proficiency testing or so-called quality accreditation does not is no guarantee about the 
quality of work turned out by a laboratory or by a, its examiners. So that has to be actually seen uh, practically from uh, his work he had actually performed. Then real time experience adds to the competency of experts. Uh, Huber and Hedrick has given a 10 point criteria to judge the proficiency and competency of a document examiner based on his affiliations and credentials, training and experience. In the opinion of these authors, those related with training and experience are relatively more important than others as they have a direct bearing on competency of the examiners. So there's a minimum requirement for training for forensic document examiners. The standard have been given by the scientific working group for forensic document examiners, which is available online free of cost. Uh, if need be, it can be consulted. They have evolved and published a standard which recommends a training program covering the minimum requirements and procedures that should be used for the fundamental training of the forensic document examiner, which a layman can never have an opportunity to do. The procedures mentioned in the set standards are mainly based on generally accepted reservoir of knowledge and experience of those who are well grounded and established as forensic document examiners. As stated in this standard, the training program shall be equivalent of a minimum of 24 months full-time training under the supervision of a principal trainer uh, and shall be successfully completed within the prescribed period of four years. The principal trainer himself shall be a forensic document examiner having successfully completed the equivalent of a minimum of 24 months full-time supervised training and shall have a minimum of full-time post-training experience of five years as a practicing forensic document examiner. The prescribed syllabus for training program covering the specific type topics of instruction are given in section seven of the said standard, which includes the practical experience gained through the supervised casework in a forensic lab and supplemental education like courses, seminars, technical visits, and workshops as well. Thus, practical knowledge and experiences gained from formal education that is prior to training, during the training, as well as post-training are essential and valuable components for becoming a successful forensic document examiner. So, expert witness and legal point of view, I have already told that Section 45 of Indian Evidence Act does not make any distinction between laymen and experts. It only says that expert is a person who is having a specialized knowledge of the subject. That's all. Anybody can have a specialized knowledge of the subject. No proof is necessary for that. It is again for the court to judge by study of his report through cross-examination and by going through his reasons. Only in that process, the court can judge whether the expert who has given the opinion is competent enough to do so or not that can be judged by his work and conduct while deposing in the court of law. Then uh, coming to the conclusive part, according to Osborne, both knowledge and experience are the basis of intelligent action in any field, a fact which is nonetheless necessary and significant as an expert witness in the court of law. Our past experiences shape our personality, which gets reflected in all our utterances and behavior in everyday life. The real experience, which is self-acquired through apprenticeship in normal course of routine over a reasonable period of time, obviously becomes self-evident and speaks for itself. And uh, according to Bishop, who is the author of the uh, recent book, uh, who has compiled the recent book, uh, handwriting uh, of the 2020, uh, rather 21st century, the training program of the forensic document examiners is very elaborate stringent and time consuming, which includes among others, the reading literature and research papers on forensic document theory, proper evidence handling, studying the scientific method, historical foundation of the forensic document examination field, copy book styles and ethics and presenting court testimony. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks to the organizers for giving me an opportunity of making this presentation. Thanks to the participants for patient listening. Hopefully, everybody will be benefited from today's presentation.